Okay, um, and uh, today uh, we have Rafael Caro Repeto who's going to be um, chairing this session for us. Um, Rafael is um, a senior scientist at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, Austria, uh, in the ethnomusicology department. So thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Claire, and, and welcome everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> for people from everywhere in the world. And welcome to this second session, very exciting session on corpora and computational analysis of non-common practice era music. So we have a very interesting lineup of three presentations for uh, this session. And uh, without further ado, you just drop in, into the presentations because that's the more interesting part of it. Maybe before some uh, reminder of procedural issues. Uh, so uh, each presenter will have 20 minutes of presentation followed by a 10 minutes Q&A Q session. Uh, I will be, I will feel entitled to uh, say the uh, presenters that they are finishing their time uh, if they exceed the presentation time. Uh, maybe I'll suggest all the presenters to mute themselves during the presentation to not uh, uh, interrupt the presenters. And uh, for the questions that you might have uh, at the end, you might just uh, uh, unmute yourself and, and show a hand or, or a virtual hand in Zoom or write in the chat that you have a question and then I invite you to direct the question or uh, you can type the question in the chat again, that's okay. Uh, and I can read the question to, to the presenters. So um, the first presentation, uh, uh, the first presenter to, today is going to be in this session is going to be uh, Dr. Andrew Brinkman, uh, who is presenting the work uh, done by himself and uh, David Hurum. Uh, this project that's going to be presented now uh, was done in 2016, while both of the authors were still present at the Ohio State University. Since then, Dr. Andrew Brinkman has become the recruiting and admission coordinator for the College of Fine Arts at Midwestern State University. And Professor Debbie Huron is currently enjoying retirement as a professor emeritus at the Ohio State University School of Music. So uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Andrew to present the paper entitled Close Cultural Corpus Creation and Statistical Tendencies in Music. So the floor is yours, Andrew. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, as uh, Raphael mentioned, so this project was one that, that David and I got started in 2016 when David was still knee deep and looking at voice leading and melodic principles and things like that. Um, and as he was kind of showing this world to me and I was exploring it as well, we, we ran into two important topics or two important uh, points um, uh, of contention in the world of, of melodic organization, especially when it comes to cross cultural studies and things like that. Um, the first point being, uh, the, the tenuous nature of the idea of a universal or the idea of a statistical tendency in music, but there might be some type of musical feature that's present in all musics across the globe. Um, the second point that we kind of ran into was the issue of uh, data availability and that uh, what you really need when you're looking at statistical tendencies or universals is large corpora and also widely diverse corpora. Um, and oftentimes you can get a large corpus uh, of one specific cultural uh, cultural musics or something along those lines. Um, or you can get a, a diverse corpus of musics, but it's relatively small. Um, the project that we're working on, the project that I'm presenting today, attempts to is an attempt to try to uh, combine these two principles together while also looking into some uh, interesting aspects of melodic organization. So diving into the, the concept of a statistical tendency or a musical universal, uh, the history of ethnomusicology has rightfully been cautious with the idea of universals, um, especially if we think to the back to the history of comparative musicology, when at times scholars were more interested in the supremacy of Western music over non-Western musics than simply the investigation of musics across the globe. However, in recent decades, uh, we've been trying to break down those barriers, and I think that we've been at least moderately successful. Scholars like Brown and Jordania have reviewed per pertinent literature over universals, uh, that have been studied in music and have uh, talked about some of the ways that scholars have gone about looking at cross-cultural musical features. So, uh, however, we noticed that the, the issue is that the, the legitimate concept of a universal is relatively unachievable. Uh, first of all, a universal meaning that in all musics everywhere, there will be some type of musical feature that we're, that we're looking for. Obviously, that's impossible for us to look at because we can't look at every single piece of music that exists. 
Um, the other issue with that is that the, the wide variety of types of music makes that highly unlikely that there would be a legitimate universal presence for all musical features. However, scholars like Bruno Nettle and others have put forth the idea of a statistical universal or statistical tendency, and that uh, a musical feature might be present in a large majority of musics. And this is something that we can tackle and have tried to tackle, uh, like other scholars, in this problem. Uh, for instance, Patrick Savage and others have looked at potential universals and other aspects of music um, and outside of melodic organization uh, and as far as instrument, instrumentation and other uh, aspects are concerned. And we're specifically focusing on the study on melodic organization. So inherent in the topic of melodic organization is the issue of defining terms like music and melody. And we recognize that terms like music and melody are culturally loaded, um, but we have to start somewhere. And uh, especially in terms of melodic organization, we know that scholars have both in Western music again and non-Western music found patterns of musical features or melodic features uh, that might be that we might say could be cross-cultural. For the purposes of this study, we we narrowed down four specific musical patterns that have been observed in Western art and folk musics and non-Western art and folk musics. Um, as something worth investigating whether or not they might be cross-cultural tendency. So these patterns are firstly pitch proximity, or the tendency for melodies to favor small intervals over larger ones. The second being leap ascension, the tendency for large intervals to ascend and for small intervals to descend. The third pitch declination is the tendency for breath delineated musical phrases to descend. And the fourth initial anacrusis is the tendency for initial strong beat to be approached by a rising contour. Taking these relatively succinct definitions together, we might propose four hypotheses. Hypothesis one, we could label pitch proximity, uh, proposes that most melodic intervals tend to be small. Hypothesis two, leap ascension, proposes that large melodic intervals tend to ascend rather than descend. Hypothesis three, pitch declination, proposes that melodic phrases tend to exhibit an overall declining pitch contour. And hypothesis four, initial anacrusis, proposes that melodic phrases tend to begin with a brief upward rise in pitch. So now we move on to the reasonings for our, our creation of this, uh, of, of this corpus. Notice that our hypotheses ask for a lot of information regarding pitch and phrase information. And they uh, test different, uh, not entirely different, but different aspects of melody. So while it is, possible to look at these things with three convenient samples that we've used, we decided for purpose, the purposes of the study to create a new sample of widely diverse uh, musical melodies. This new sample we're calling the Akora Folkways uh, collection at, based on the materials from which it comes from. When creating any new corpus, it's important that we, that we recognize the inherent biases that are uh, present whenever we go about the collection process. So in attempting to avoid these biases and collecting our materials, we allowed other scholars to do that for us. Specifically, we allowed the Radio France Accora and the Smithsonian Folkways labels to provide the, the uh, records necessary for uh, transcription for these corpora or for this corpus. Radio France Accora, founded in 1957, describes itself as specializing in traditional musics from across the globe. Whereas Smithsonian Folkways Records, founded in 1948, aims to record and document music from around the world, supporting cultural diversity and an increased understanding among peoples. Taken each one alone, uh, there is not sufficient representation, or we did not feel like there was sufficient representation by culture, region, nation, or what have you. However, by combining these two together, not only do we attempt to eliminate biases that might be present in either record label alone, but we also help to to establish an even wider reach for our corpus creation. Once we established the, the, the record labels from which we'd be pulling the musics, it became important for us to define exactly what pieces or works we would be taking from these record labels. Of course, defining something like pieces or works in a non-Western uh, context is difficult to do. So instead, we simply labeled that our pieces or works would be the individual tracks of the Radio France Cora and Smithsonian Folkways labels. After that point, it became important for us to be able to find, define exactly what a melody was. And we recognize that while essentially a Western concept, 
Ethnomusicologists have determined that many non-Western cultures produce some sorts of music that could be deemed melody-like, at least from a Western uh, gaze. And as our study focuses primarily on melodic organization, we needed to determine a process by which we could determine melody-like processes in a given musical passage, especially in non-Western music. So this brings the table that I have on screen. When going through the different tracks for the Elkora Folkways collection, it became necessary for us to put each track into a specific category of melody-like passages. And here you can see text categories 1 through 15, from most melody-like to least melody-like. And essentially what this is saying is that what we deemed to be the most melody-like or texture category one was a single voice singing by itself, followed by multiple voices singing in harmony. And this is arranged from most melody-like to least melody-like. So from here we go to single wind instruments playing by themselves to multiple wind instruments playing in harmony. At this point, we allow for potentially other voices or other uh, instruments to be playing in accompaniment. And so the next stage is single voices accompanied by something that's not performing the same melodic line to multiple voices accompanied. Again, followed by single wind instruments that are accompanied to multiple wind instruments are, that are accompanied. Finally, our last couple of categories include single non-wind instruments followed by multiple non-wind instruments in harmony, single non-wind instruments accompanied to multiple non-wind non instruments accompanied, and an other category that was a catch-all that might include things like, say for instance, non-pitched drum ensembles or solo percussion uh, features. In total, the size of our Okora Folk Waste collection pulled from some 696 tracks from 84 different CDs. 114 of those fit into category one, which was our best fit category, and about half of them overall come from accompanied, are, are accompanied in some shape, form, or fashion. During the process of the transcription process, we started with category one tracks and moved down to category 15, where about 10% of the, the tracks fit into category 15. Along the way, as some of our hypotheses had to deal with phrase related information, it was important for us to define exactly what a phrase is. So we noticed that in lingua, uh, both in uh, speech prosody and in musical studies that phrases tend to be linked with breathing. Therefore, stops, starts and stops of breathing might equal phrases. So we can assume that a track might start with the beginning of a phrase and, and stop with the end of a phrase, because likely it, it was the case that the, the ethnographers for the two record labels were recording full songs and not songs halfway in the middle. That is not necessarily the case, and we don't know that for certain. So this is something that we have to be caution to, take caution with. However, it is, it is likely that we could expect this to have occurred. Uh, another way that we can deline delineate between phrase starts and endings is by changing textures. And of course, this is dangerous as our own Western biases might affect how we determine starts and stops. Um, but again, with the lack of, uh, of other methods to, to come up with at the time, we felt like this was the best course of action. So in a given track, what we might find is the first phrase we could encode as starting with the very beginning of the track and ending with the first audible break or breath and pause. If that wasn't possible, because say the instrument was a non-wind instrument, we would hear the first cha ex exceptional change in texture. Uh, on the same track, we could also find a second phrase at the end of the track, uh, where the ending of the track itself was considered to be the ending phrase boundary, and we would work backwards from there, seeking either the first breath pause or the first substantial change in texture. The transcription process itself, once we had narrowed down how we would go about looking at phrases, um, it's, it can be troublesome. We note, we note that uh, transcription, of course, necessarily is going to eliminate information that might be deemed important or useful by the performers. However, um, the transcription also can be highly useful for us, the researchers, as for our hypotheses specifically, we're interested in, in absolute pitch and phrase-related information. And these things are exactly what we attempt to transcribe. So for instance, the, in a given recording, we transcribed only monophonic lines, the most melody-like of those lines, and to transcribe them based on absolute pitch. Glissandi were marked where appropriate, and we noted about 100 instances of those. Rapid ch pitch changes fit into five different categories. You could categorize them as brief and narrow rapid pitch changes, akin to the Western concept of the mordant, of which there were about 141. Brief wide pitch changes, of which there were about three, 
I extended narrow pitch changes akin to the Western concept of a trill, of which there were 63. Extended wide pitch changes akin to the Western concept of a yodel, which is seven, and a generic ornament designation uh, of which there were about 67. When looking at rhythm, we had two different designations, metric and ametric, where metric included time signatures where relevant and bar lines, and ametric had no bar lines whatsoever, but we attempted to distinguish between strong and weak beats uh, using rhythmic durations. Repeated unisons were given special markings and audible rests were encoded, uh, encoded especially if a breath, breath was audibly heard. Finally, instrumentation was encoded by using a more modified version of the horn Brussels socks uh, method. In addition to our Accora Folkways corpus, we, for the purposes of the study, included three convenient samples. The Densmore Native American collection of some 2,000 Native American songs pulled from a plethora of Native American cultures. The Essen German folk song collection, which is some 6,000 songs pulled primarily from the region of modern day Germany. And the Essen Chinese folk song collection, which is some 2,000 folk songs pulled primarily from Han origin, but also with other Chinese cultural groups as well. In all corpora, including the Rapora folkways, we include phrase related information. And the aggregate sample includes some 83 cultures. But what we are missing primarily from these four different corpora are a substantial representation from the Arabian Peninsula, from the Indonesian and Polynesian islands, and from Australia. Moving on, we can talk about our, the, res the results of our study. For hypothesis one, recall that hypothesis one with pitch proximity and purported that most melodic intervals tend to be small. In order to carry out the testing for hypothesis one, we devised three separate tests. For the first test, we elected to compare an average interval size for each melody or each folk song available across the corpus to the average interval size and a scrambled version of those melodies. Across every single one of these, we did not, we did not measure intervals across rests and each original and randomized melody had one average interval size. From those average interval sizes, we then collect, calculated the grand average. As you can see from these tables, or from table two specifically, uh, nearly 100% of the original melodies had more small intervals than the randomized melodies, with the exception of the Okora folkways, though it was well above 50%. For the second test, we decided to see if there was a skew in the average towards smaller intervals, as would be claimed in our hypothesis. For this, we simply calculated the average melodic interval size of the original melodies, and then counted the number of intervals that were greater or lesser than average. And you can see that in table three. Again, results are consistent in this test with our hypothesis that small interval sizes tend to predominate. Our third test, which is much more informal, was simply examining the instances of ornamentation that I discussed earlier, these rapid pitch gestures. And again, we can see that the small uh, pitch gestures vastly outnumber the wide pitch gestures. Moving on, uh, for hypothesis two, leap ascension, recall that hypothesis two purports that large melodic intervals tend to ascend rather than descend. For this hypothesis, we simply created or uh, counted raw tallies of all melodic intervals without counting rests. In this case, all four of the corpora had about 60% of their semitones three or lower descend, whereas about 60% of their semitones seven or more ascend, showing again that our results are consistent with the hypothesis that large intervals tend to ascend and small intervals tend to descend. For hypothesis three, pitch declination, recall that hypothesis three states that melodic phrases tend to exhibit an overall declining pitch contour. Here, we could, treat, we could treat notes as points on a contour and determine from that contour the best fit regression slope. The slopes will then determine whether or not the, the overall uh, contour of the melody was ascending or descending. We calculated separate slopes for each phrase and each melody and then calculated from those slopes a grand average. Again, we can see that results are consistent with our hypothesis that melodic phrases tend to exhibit an overall declining pitch contour. For hypothesis four, initial anacrusis, recall that it states that melodic phrases tend to begin with a brief upward rise in pitch. For hypothesis four, we simply compared the interval between the first two pitches in a phrase. Again, we can see that results are consistent 
However, notice that for the Native Americans specifically, this is inconsistent. No, upon noticing this, we decided to control for unisons as well. And once we do control for unisons, we find that again, ascending in intervals, even for the Native American collection, vastly outnumber descending intervals in the beginning. Overall, our, our uh, study finds that uh, our, our, our results were consistent with our hypotheses across the board. Hypothesis one, uh, all, and all four corpora were consistent with the idea that small intervals predominate and might suggest that uh, pitch proximity is not merely an artifact of range constraints. For hypothesis two, we had moderate evidence across all four repertoires that small intervals descended and large intervals ascended. However, we might notice that the preponderance for small intervals might recall uh, might ask us to rethink the, the name of this uh, pitch pattern of leap ascension and instead call it step descent rather than leap, and leap ascension. Though so that's completely debatable. Um, for hypothesis three, we had consistent results across all four corpora and that we had an overall de declining pitch contour. And again, for hypothesis four, once controlling for unisons, we noticed that most intervals at the very beginning of phrases tend to ascend rather than descend. So in conclusion, our results suggest that there are some possible melodic features that might be cross-cultural and we might consider them to be statistical tendencies. However, as I'm sure you are all aware, and we are as well, further testing and theorizing definitely needs to be done before we can say anything uh, concrete about this. Um, we hope that in the process of carrying out this project that we have contributed to dialogue and corpus creation techniques. And as we move forward with this project, we hope to continue to grow the current uh, for a folk waste corpus, including more resources where possible, and we hope to study more melodic patterns to see if this cross-cultural validity is present. And with that, I will end. Great, thank you so much, Andrew, for the great uh, presentation and uh, for the great work, of course. And so now the floor is open to anyone who has a question I said uh, you can either uh, post it in the chat or let me know somehow. Uh, maybe, and you would you mind to stop sharing your screen so that, uh, that could be. Oh, yes, sorry. So now I have more people in the screen to see. Uh, I, I don't see anyone uh, with a question, so I have several myself. So I, I, I'll be asking until anyone has another one. Uh, yeah, I, I love. I really enjoyed your your paper. Uh, this is a, a very a very a delicate topic, uh, as you know. And uh, uh, but uh, I I appreciate in the paper how aware are, are you of all the all the possible biases and all the possible shortcomings of, of such an, an endeavor. So the reader is totally uh, uh, equipped with all all, all the uh, judgments to to evaluate what, 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 what you did. So that that's that's really great. Uh, I have a question about uh, the transcriptions. See, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, it's a sensible uh, step. And uh, so uh, who are the transcribers? The, the transcribers are uh, primarily me, but then David also worked on them. We've got some, uh, we have a, a handful of individuals that are contributing to this as well, um, uh, but not, this is something that is on, an ongoing thing, if that makes sense. Um, the, the, Initial work was primarily this. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm happy to see that Beach Clark is uh, seconding my question, so which is uh, describing the transcription process in more detail, uh, uh, because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a key step. Uh, 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 for example, were there any discussion process? So you, you mentioned that um, we're mostly uh, uh, David and you transcribing. Where moments where you decide to to come to agreements because these these musics are not easy to transcribe, especially in such a uh, system as a as yeah yeah certainly yeah um, we uh, we I didn't have enough room necessarily in the paper to to discuss, uh, describe that process, but it was pretty in depth. Um, I should mention that at, when we were figuring out the transcription process, it was actually part of a of a class that David Huron had put on way back in 2016. And so he had opened the floor up to, to the entire class to discuss the transcription process and what they thought would work and what, would, what didn't work. Um, and so uh, one, of the, the, one of the main things that people came up with, and then this is one of the things that I tried to harp on in the presentation itself, was the definition of a phrase, um, which was something that was, it's, it's tenuous. And, and uh, some individuals brought up uh, and the, the idea that 
it would be impossible for us to define a phrase because to define a phrase is, an, an, is inherently placing our Western biases on all these musics, which I mean, all these musics are for the most part non-Western musics, though we do include uh, traditional musics from the European and, and North American continents as well. Um, so that was a that was a discussion that was had, and then later on when we started putting the when David and I started putting the, the work together, um, we discussed a lot about the the transcription process as far as uh, what what we would need to do uh, and what things that we would need to cover. Um, we as far as how we actually transcribe them, uh, and I didn't describe this in the paper because I uh, feared it would take up too much space. Uh, we primarily transcribe these into the current format, which for those of you who are familiar with Pumdrum, that is that is the primary format that we use, um, which is a, it, it is a big project of, of David's himself, and it's something that, that I personally am a big fan of. Um, and ideally what we were, or not ideally, but what, what we were doing was listening to the tracks um, and then pitch by pitch, notating them on a score as it was easier to put them on the, onto some music notation software to begin with. And then as we, once we finish putting them into music notation so software, it's a relatively simple thing to convert that into the current format from there. Um, and so that's where I, I mentioned that, of course, when you're doing something like this and you're notating it in Western music notation, which is essentially the step that we took, you're necessarily leaving out a lot of important parts of music. Um, and, and that's, unfortunately, I feel like that, that is, at least in the, the path that we took, that was a necessary risk that we had to take. And that's part of the reason why the, the main focuses of our study involved information that we felt would be easy or for the most part, relatively uncontroversial, so pitch information. Um, but however, again, you know, that is still, it's still controversial because uh, the, as I mentioned, these rapid pitch gestures, at times we didn't know exactly what to call them. And of course we wouldn't know exactly what to call everything. These repeated unisons we saw pop up a lot, especially uh, in, in, well, and several different musical cultures. And of course, there's something special that needed to necessarily be done. Um, and we decided to use more of a, of a marking, a designation for something like that, rather than try to treat every one of those individually. Uh, excellent. Uh, um, uh, Claire Arthur asks, is uh, this Accorda for Grace Corpus is publicly available? And I would add, is, are your transcriptions uh, publicly available? They will be, they will be. Um, as we have other, other authors that are getting involved in the process and we're finalizing everything like that, we want to wait until everyone's had a chance and then, then we can include more than just myself and David Huron and people that have contributed to this project. Um, and so they will be, hopefully, uh, I imagine within the coming months. Um, that is something that we want to do. Uh, but we, we want to make sure that we give credit where credit is due for the people that have been involved. Yeah, excellent. Bitch uh, uh, Clark has another question. Can you characterize the historical time period covered by the corpora? Yeah, uh, yes. And that's something that we, we thought about, but it was, it was one of those things where we weren't necessarily sure what, what would be the best practice. So we, we chose what we thought would be the lesser of you know, two or three or four evils, if that makes sense. And that um, these recordings primarily come from the, the Radio France of Cora and Smithsonian Folkways, which were both uh, in the time period of the, the, around the 1950s till I think the, the most recent CD was closer to 2000. So the recordings themselves are fairly recent. And for each one of those recordings, we would have to do uh, some fairly in-depth ethnographic work to determine exactly what time period those individual songs may have come from, if it would be even possible for us to find that. Um, and that is a that is an issue, especially in my own personal work, that that uh, as far as time period of, of ethnographic materials is concerned, um, it, it's, a, it's an issue, but it's an issue that that that. It's a, again, it's a, it's a necessary issue that we have to kind of deal with. I hope that answered the question. Um, the convenient samples themselves come from different time periods, uh, specifically the Essen folk song collection is primarily 19th century uh, German folk songs. Um, however, that's debatable. Um, and in general, I would say that the exact time period from which these songs originate, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to find any of them across all the, not just our corpus, but across any of the corpora, corpora that include folk materials. 
Great. So we have time for one last question. If someone has any last question to direct to Andrew. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'll ask myself. As, yeah, that's a very generic question. So uh, uh, the, 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 the main uh, 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 aspect of your research that I take issue on is, is the definition of, of phrase, as, as you already uh, mm -hmm. characterized. Ha have you thought of in engaging insiders for each of the traditions that you uh, are studying to help you uh, define this process? Yes. Uh, funnily enough, it was it was this project itself that kind of helped start the seed in, in me personally of ethnomusicology because it was this project that made me say oh man we really do need to we do need to get with each one of these cultures and figure these things out um at, at the time when we were laying down the groundwork for this uh david's biggest concern was that we wouldn't have the time uh, nor would we have the expertise necessary i mean i was but a lowly you know a phd student at the time um and so we were worried that if we were worried that doing something like that would take a considerable amount of time to do, which, as you can tell, four years or well, five years later after the start of this project, it has taken a long time just to get this far. Um, that is something that, that we have discussed a lot. Um, I, I would like to do something like that, um, but I defer. I, I also defer to my co-author on this, and David is, is, I wouldn't say against the idea, but he doesn't want to take too terribly, he doesn't want to take years and years to potentially go through something like this. Um, I, I hope that helps. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. So, so maybe one last, very last question that I see in, in the chat from Conkling. I guess it's Darrell Conkling. Uh, can you describe your randomization control procedure? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I, I'm having to remember back exactly on how I did this. Um, I mean, if I recall exactly, it was. In, uh, it was fairly simple in that we just we would take a, a, a given melody and essentially use I think uh, I think at the time I was using maybe a Perl uh, this simple randomization function in Perl um, to reorder the notes in the in the melody itself. Um, we did not use any we did not use any formal or created specifically for the purposes of this project method of randomizing um, as we were worried that at the time we were worried that some we might put our own biases into the randomization process and with as much biases as we were putting into this project project in general the last thing that we wanted to do was was bias ourselves on the random sampling process as, as well so our deferment to the experts on that uh, so to speak were, were to use the built-in functions uh, uh, of the language that we're using around that time Great. So thank you so much, Andrew, for your presentation of, um, for your work. Uh, um, it's time now to move on to our, our next presenter, um, which is already with us. Uh, yeah, uh, I see her here is, is Nadia Carvalho, who will be presenting on behalf of herself and Sara Gonzalez Gutierrez, Javier Merchan, Sanchez Jara, Gilberto Bernardes, and Maria Navarro Cáceres. Uh, so the work she's be presenting uh, now is been carried out in the context of the, uh, an European project called uh, CoPoem, Platform for the Collaborative Generation of European Popular Music, which is led by Dr. Maria Navarro Cáceres, one of the authors of, of, of the paper presented now. So most of the authors come, uh, are affiliated to Universidad de Salamanca in Spain, um, except for, uh, except from uh, Gilberto Bernardes and Nadia herself, who's pursuing her PhD in, in, in this university. So um, Nadia, the floor is yours to present the, this paper entitled Encoding, Analyzing, and Modeling iFolk, a new database of Iberian folk music, whenever you want. You, you are muted, Nadia, if, if we cannot hear you. Yeah. Now. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, uh, hello everyone, I'm Nadia, and I will be presenting Guy Folk, a new database of Iberian folk music, which we developed as part of the Copone project. So, as you said, I'll be speaking on behalf of my fellow researchers, and uh, we will also present a new standardized model to musically annotate Iberian folk music and uh, develop tools for navigating and retrieving this database. 
Folk music, and in particular that of oral tradition, have significantly influenced society, being a great part of our culture. Iberian folk music comprises the music of Porto and Spain, and you can hear a small example of this kind of music in this video. Since the beginning of the 20th century, ethnomusicology has been proposing strategies to facilitate the transmission and learning of folk music to the communities. And uh, we can see a small example of these new proposals that, uh, that have been made in the later years. To promote Iberian folk music in schools and formal musical learning environments, some ethnomusicologists wish to incorporate this kind of uh, folk music into the educational curriculum. However, folk music collections are usually incomplete, offline, or not focused on educational purposes. So, for example, they do not incorporate any musical analysis, and it is difficult for teachers to plan classes for specific music features, such as rhythmic patterns or melodies. In the context of the Copoem project, we intend to pursue the task of bringing Iberian folk music to the educational environments. As the first part of the project, we collected a database of 250 lullabies and children's songs from Spain and Portugal and constructed a model to analyze the musical features of this music. We'll present here our publicly available database, Caldai Folk, and the digital platform mainly directed at educators, where one can search for traditional repertoire based on ethnomusicological and educational criteria, such as scales, genres, uh, rhythmic patterns, or melodic areas. In a second phase, we are developing a children target space in the platform to promote Iberian folk music through educational and interactive games. To understand why it was important to differently encode this database, we started by analyzing and collecting the characteristics of music from Portugal and Spain based on a systematic study of the songs in our database. This music encompasses musical expressions that have been preserved due to their transmission from generation to generation. In our data set, we found that the most common properties can be summarized in model melodic systems that are very popular within these songs melodic profiles, reduced melodic branches, generally between the fifth and the sixth, and they do not uh, exceed the one octave mostly. Unstable or chromatic notes that appear throughout the song and do not follow the standards of classical music. Harmony that is practically outside the cadential space or even completely non-existent. Prosodic rhythms or regular rhythms associated with dances and lullabies. Rhythmic patterns that are traditionally linked to specific genres and time signatures, and particular musical structures based on the repetition of chorus texts and or stanzas. From these properties, we analyze the possible solutions for encoding the inherent information from these songs. So we started the encoding of our database by exploring and adapting the music encoding initiative standard. As you may know, May is an open source effort to define a system for encoding musical documents in a machine read readable structure. And it reunites a lot of specialists from different areas of the, of the broad range of musical documents and, and structures also. And they are formalized in an XML May schema that comprises a core set of rules for recording these kind of uh, the, all types of songs. It is very widely disseminated because of its potential for encoding information about the notation, but also about its intellectual content, contrary to other standards. Uh, because of the specific nature of our database, it was necessary to adapt some parts of the May schema so that important information was stored and easily accessible. The ultimate goal is to unpack common patterns between pieces from the same geographical area or even the same genre at the melodic, harmonic, or rhythmic levels. 
We use new and adapted labels to analyze and encode these features that did not exist in the original. For example, on the header, we added source and bibliographic labels such as collector or encoder, but also title, region of the song, and uh, some notes that uh, were made during the, transcri the transcription and encoding process. Uh, and we also uh, added some general music analysis information that influences the whole song, such as the ambitus, the mode, the tempo, the textual and musical insipid and genre. On the body, we added primarily inexistent musical features that change a long time and that the encoder has analyzed and interpreted, such as rhythmic pattern, musical structure, rest notes and general text. Having defined the iFox database encoding, we will detail the strategies adopted to allow fluid access, navigation, and retrieval of the database information. As mentioned before, we had to take into account that we were focusing on the educational community as our target group. To this end, we developed a web platform for presenting the iFolk database to the public in which a, a user can search based on ethnomusicological and musical criteria. And uh, we implemented two solutions for navigating the iFolk database on the web. A filter-based query interface for se searching songs that match specific user-defined criteria, and a similarity navigation interface where all the songs are displayed on a screen grouped by a similarity at given criteria. For each song, we store a set of metadata properties, the ones we talked about before, the May file from which we extract the metadata, and uh, a compressed pickle file in which every event in the original musical score is parsed into a multiple viewpoint system indexed by its own set. The multiple viewpoint systems were proposed by Conklin and use the domain knowledge to drive new representations for encoding temporal events from the musical structure by abstracting property types, which can be derived from each other. This information can be later used to model the musical structure for automatic music generation, for example, or to determine the similarity between melodies or rhythm from one song to another. As mentioned previously, we implemented these two methods for querying the Eiffel database, which we will we'll now explain. The first solution is re relatively common in information systems dealing with databases, yet requires some expert degree of knowledge to specify the search criteria. The metadata-based uh, query interface promotes an exploration of the annotated songs metadata information on the database, and its interface includes a compound query system, used, which you can see on the screen, uh, that allows the user to specify multiple simultaneous criteria. Each query criteria is then applied as a filter, as you've, as you've seen, to the database, and uh, multiple values can be selected, as you will see just now. The query results are listed in alphabetic order over several pages with 10 elements each, and we show the name, the indexation name, an audio, and the uh, interlink that includes all collected song information from the query results song. We propose this second solution, the similar similarity search, to accommodate a broader exploration of the corpus by a non-expert user. It promotes a more visual navigation of the database by demonstrating the relationship between songs in a two-dimensional similarity space. Different visualizations underlying different user-defined criteria are promoted, such as the ones re relating to metadata that, are, that were incorporated into the last solution, which are on the screen in the blue box, but also musically sensitive criteria, such as a song's underlying melody, rhythmic line, or a global measure that includes these two and that uh, relays the shape of several elementary and derived information in a metrical space. Each song is represented in the 2D space by a circular graphical element, whose distances denote their similarity at given user-defined criteria as in these figures. The color of the 2D points representing each song also groups them according to a second user-defined criteria. Upon reviewing the state of the art, we adopted two algorithms for projecting the distance matrix into a 2D visualization using dimensionality reduction algorithms, the uniform manifold approximation and projection, 
which is called UMAP, and the T distributed stochastic network embedding, TSNI. Uh, in our informal empirical experiments with the IFLOC database, we denoted that UMAP provides a more precise clustering of the data in comparison with TSNI. In this example, we can see that there is a lot less songs in the small cluster on TSNE than what we know exists of Portuguese songs. We, however, as we did not have documented evidence of this uh, better use of UMAP over TSNE, we, we decided to leave the choice to the user. A lot of research has been focusing on comparing mel melody or rhythmic of different songs, mainly motivated by the copyright industry and finding segment occurrences in musical works. In this research, we departed from Anya Volk's studies on Netherlands folk music similarity. Uh, this work concluded that the structure induction and the local alignment algorithms performed the best when comparing segments of variable length within these melodies. Uh, the main difference between these two algorithms is shown in these two figures. Siam explored the notes in a musical sequence, a set of points in an n-dimensional space, and computes the number of transformations from one song space to another, while uh, LA focuses on comparing subregions of the two songs according to the number of insertions, deletions, and substitutions needed to and transform one region into another. However, after applying the algorithms on the IFOC dataset, we concluded that the original settings considered for these algorithms were not appropriate for our type of music. In this sense, we adapted the algorithms to take into account other features, features that we thought were more relevant. Uh, the features are inputted into the algorithms as point sets. In CIM, we calculate the difference between two adjacent events and measure the maximum occurrence. Uh, between uh, the, these various translations that, as the distance between the songs. In LA, we calculate the matches between the subregions of the songs using the wall feature vector as the symbol being compared. Uh, using only pitch and on set, for example, we, which are the two examples we see here on the, on the screen, we can see the main differences about the two algorithms in the figures. Uh, CIM would get a better value in this case as there is only a, really a translational vector with a difference from one sequence, sequence to another. LA would get a lower volume because the maximum subsequent encounters only has a two node length. Uh, considering the features we used for melody, we compared several combinations of onset and pitch or musical intervals as you can see uh, in, these, in these figures that we put here. Uh, the difference between pitch and interval accounts for key invariance. In the context of folk music, this is important in the sense that several melodies may appear at different keys. In the, in the educational context, taking this information into account would allow educators to adjust the similar melodies to the kids' pitch range. For rhythm, we computed distances for several combinations of the notes on set and duration features, such as absolute duration, contour, position within the bar, and its speed strength. We show in the slide some examples of combinations using absolute duration and position in bar for the two uh, segments that we showed them. We also experimented with the Levenstein distance algorithm because of its popularity in this context, but quickly found that the results were not very good compared to the other algorithms. For the global similarity measure, we compared point sets using combinations of many of these previous components. Following our analysis of the IFOC database, we found that it had a reduced melodic range, as you may remember, and most of its rhythmic patterns were linked to a specific genre or time signature that have been present throughout the tradition. In this sense, on making our analysis of similarity within the database, we expected that it would be balanced across the similarity measures, revealing these tradition-aware relationships within the songs in the database. In the following slides, we will we'll tell some insights into our preliminary experiences with this set of algorithms. If, if we use onset for comparing songs with different time signatures, such as the ones we can hear on these slides, And 
this one. We can easily see that they sound very similar. Similar, they are just written in different metrical spaces, which is not uncommon across folk music transcriptions. But our algorithms would get uh, resulting distance values with uh, nearly the maximum dissimilarity value while using the onset information. On the contrary, adopting point sets with only pitch or intervals for computing the distance of these two songs usually resulted in them being perceived as nearly identical. Using LA instead of CM achieved more balanced uh, distance scores across the whole database. On rhythm, similarly to melodies, the adoption of note on set poorly captures the perceptual similarity between rhythmic sequences using both algorithms. The adoption of absolute duration improves our intuition about the rhythmic similarity in the folk music examples which you can hear now. Examples that the problem because while uh, only using absolute duration leads to songs uh, such as the, those being considered very alike because of the type of figures that they use, but they are not really, they don't have the same metrical structure, they don't uh, sound similar in terms of rhythm. The other example we had on melody also raises an important issue that can be captured with the current point sets or distances under study because most humans will perceive them as very similar because of the, the accents that result from their metrical organization. But as the duration and even uh, other metrical transformations are not taken into account, we should explore in the future some metrically invariant representations. For the context of global similarity, most of the songs present really high values of dissimilarity using both algorithms. The three songs in this slide appear as a small cluster on the, on the similarity settings we have. And we can listen to them now to see that the, these two While these two may seem considerably similar and could be clustered con considering the, the use of similar rhythmic figures, this one is not uh, at all similar either in rhythmic or melodic uh, sequence. In this sense, and also uh, preliminary preliminary evaluation demonstrated that the original Siam algorithm had more balanced results than the, any combination of feature, features used with LA. F future research on other global similarity measures should be pursued for the IFOLC database. To conclude, we presented three original contributions for the field of musical annotation, consisting of a standardized model to musical annotate Tibarian folk music, departing from the existing main models, a new database named IFOLC with annotated files following the proposed model, and uh, tools for navigating and retrieving folk music contents from the database. A particular emphasis is given to the educational application of the proposed model, contents, and tools in educational settings and schools. Ultimately, we strive for the promotion of Iberian folk music to the educators community. In the future, we want to further explore a better systematic evaluation of the similarity measures within the live folk database. And we also aim at evaluating the interface itself to understand how well the underlying similarity concepts are conveyed to the users and how successful is the system in aiding the teaching of the repertoire and these features. Some references that guided our work. Thanks for the attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nadia, for the presentation. And congratulations to all the authors for, for, for the work, uh, very, very interesting work. Um, so now the floor is open 
for your questions. Uh, yeah, Vivian uh, Teresa is is congratulating you for the cool project and and thank you for thank you for the presentation. Uh, so if anyone has a question, just uh, make any sign or or just uh, uh, post it in in the chat. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, Nadia, what are your sources? Uh, so you, you didn't transcribe, right? So so one of the slides you showed, you're, you're, you're using printed sources, right? And, and mm -hmm. transnotate, yeah? Yeah, we use some, a lot of uh, printed sources and transcribed sources uh, from, for example, for music from Salamanca, uh, some uh, works that have already been collected by, in Portugal, for example, by, um, the famous ethnomusicological uh, ethnomusicologist um, not remember his name now Garcia uh, Matos uh, no um, in Portugal is a oh, in Portugal um, yeah I, I think in Spain we have from Garcia Matos for example for Miguel Manzano uh from um from a, a whole lot of different sources and uh, from portugal we have mostly from from the the library of coimbra some folk song books that we found there uh but uh, most of them were from um, from two different authors only so uh, I, this... I'm not remember really the name of the elder, but it is a very, very popular uh, ethnomusicological a musicologist from the mid 20th, uh, mid 20th century. Okay, yeah, because these are transcriptions from the early, from the first half of the 20th yeah. Century, right? century. Yeah, yeah, mostly, yeah. yes. I've seen that in, 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 in the, I'm looking now at the retrieval uh, uh, platform that you created. The lyrics are not there, so do, do uh, no, not yet. Them in the future. Yeah, yeah, we we actually collect them. They are in the May files uh, uh -huh. associated with the each note that they they relate to. But uh, at the moment, we were more interested into the, the general melodic and rhythmic lines, for example, and the more musical uh, settings, and then. Now we are adding the lyrics to the to the platform because, uh, for example, one of the interactive games we are working with is singing the song, so we will have the lyrics, of course. Great, great. Yeah. So if anyone has any other question or comment for Nadia and uh, this work, please just let me know. Yeah, I think Claire has a question. Please, whenever you want. Yeah, I just had a question um, about the kind of similarity um, stuff you're talking about the rhythm and I can see how in some ways, um, like, for example, earlier you showed an example where uh, one was in six, eight and one was in three, eight or something like that. And so in some ways, like having uh, the meter not matter. Um, or at least the time signature not matter um, can actually be beneficial in some ways because things um, are not necessarily consistently transcribed. So in some ways that um, facilitates the matching. But in other ways, I wonder if having accent uh, would help to, so that's a problem in terms of like perception um, in terms of what people think are similar versus what a human might, a uh, computer might think is uh, similar, of course can be different, but I wonder if, uh, you considered the role of like accent in, in, uh, in any way. Um, so I, I see this like pros and cons of sort of including the meter there, but it, what, you know, having it versus not having it, if you kind of had played with that or what, what it. Yeah, actually in the first setting, we didn't add a more, more metrical information and more accent information as you've seen on this paper, but uh, we are actually adapting because we didn't find some results as we've seen are not really that good because of, of the problem of metrics and accent. And what human perceive is that, for example, those two songs were equal 
and uh, and it's not what the computer perceives and now we are making some uh, some uh, advances on the similarity measure and we are is exactly analyzing uh, the uh, them by accent and uh, uh, taking into account the, the accents of of the song Cool. So you actually are running um, perceptual studies as well as a part of this project? Uh, uh, not yet, but yes, we are we are looking for for running perceptual uh, tests. Wow, cool. Thank you. It's really interesting stuff. Great. For so the last chance to ask a question to Nadia today. Of course, you can always contact them. Uh, so uh, if anyone has a last uh, minute question. Then uh, if don't, I think we can stop here and, and move to the next uh, presenters. Uh, so thank you very much, Nadia, for your work and, and to your colleagues uh, uh, for, for the work you're doing. Thank uh, you. Great. So um, to conclude this uh, session, uh, we have uh, two presenters uh, and, and they are already setting uh, their presentation, uh, which is great. So the presenters today are going to be Jules Cournot and Mathieu Giraud, um, who are going to be presenting the work that they did with their colleagues, uh, Louis Bigot, Nicolas Martin, and David Ragnier. So um, except from Nicolas Martin, who works in Arobas Music, the producer of, of, of the software Kita Pro, the rest of the researchers are members of the Chris of Cristo, the research center in computer science signal automatic control of the Université de Lille. And uh, they're going to be presenting uh, this work that was uh, carried out in the research group Algomus, uh, Algorithmic Musicology. So uh, with further ado, uh, I, I led the presenters, uh, Jules Cornu and Mathieu Giraud to present the work, uh, what are the most used uh, guitar positions? So the floor is yours when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Raphael, and thank you also, Claire, for organizing uh, this conference. Uh, so uh, actually, yes, we are from a research team and we work with Arobas Music with a company to, uh, to study here, to study guitar position. Uh, so uh, all what we do today is based on tablatures. So what is tablatures? Uh, tablatures, today we understand this world as uh, something that describes how the, how the instrument might be played instead of the actual notes. Tablature are very old. Here it's an example of the first printed score in uh, 1507. And uh, this score uh, contained uh, lute in tabulation, that means an arrangement for the lute by Francesco Spinacino, by a polyphonic song by Josquin Desprez. We will hear later this, uh, this song. Uh, and, uh, somehow you see that here this tablature is somewhat different than what the tablature we are used to today because the higher frets here, the higher strings are on the lower and now we represent usually the higher strings on the higher of the, uh, the, uh, of the top of the tablature. Anyway, that's a tablature so showing strings and uh, showing frets in which you can put your fingers to play notes. Uh, but also, I mean, we have uh, tablatures today are used mostly uh, by, I mean, pop and rock uh, guitar players. For example, let's hear some, uh, some well-known song by Sting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jules. Uh, you can just put a little higher the guitar in order to see, see your, uh, what you are playing. So, I mean, when Jules is playing this riff, uh, I mean, he can, he can play it by art, he can play it following the score, but he can also play it following the tablature. And actually, many guitar players uh, that are most from, I mean, the pop, uh, the rock um, communities do not read scores or read, read barely scores and they just rely on the tablatures. And sometimes the tablatures do include the rhythm information, and sometimes uh, the guitar player just know uh, themselves and know the rhythm they are playing, and they just use the tablature as an aid to, uh, to play, to know which fingers will, will be played. Okay, 
so today, I mean, the content uh, for talk will be in two parts. Uh, the first one, Jules, will uh, explain, I mean, what we did to encode tablature, I mean, what kind of vectors we can use just to encode an information in a tablature. But, uh, and what we can have to, to also draw information from GitHub profiles. And then I will present some uh, first corpus analysis we do, we did on my songbook. So yes, um, <clears throat> one of the most uh, common um, encoding for music information is uh, the piano encoding, um, which is a very uh, simple encoding. Um, you have, um, some vectors with uh, zero and ones, and uh, each component of your vector uh, will uh, uh, represent uh, one note. And if you have a one, uh, one, a one in your component, it means that uh, this note is played at this uh, at this time. And uh, you will have, for example, uh, one vector every sixteenth note to represent a rhythm. Uh, so um, this representation is quite simple, but does it uh, suit guitar and um, and um, yeah, guitar playing, uh, uh, not really, because uh, you don't uh, you you don't have any information for string and fret. Uh, so we uh, we came up with a new encoding, which is uh, the string fret encoding, with uh, one vector also composed of uh, zeros and ones. And you have uh, six parts of this vector, uh, one by strings, and each part is composed of uh, twenty five uh, components which represents uh, each fret on your guitar. So uh, basically it just represents uh, all of your fretboard on your guitar. And uh, when you have one, it means that you have a put uh, your, your finger uh, at this uh, place on your, on your guitar. So this vector will be uh, very large. And uh, we, uh, we were thinking, does it really uh, fit uh, what the guitarist thinks when they play? So we thought, uh, because there is an, uh, a very uh, important concept on guitar, which is a quasi isomorphism, um, which is a simple concept that means uh, when you have a pattern which you play somewhere on your guitar. So uh, here we have, uh, for example, the A minor pentatonic scale. So you play like this. And uh, if you take this pattern and you, um, play exactly the same, the same position of your hand and fingers, and you play it uh, two, uh, two frets above on, the, on your fretboard, it will be like this, which is uh, the B minor pentatonic scale. So it's very easy to transpose things on your, on your guitar. And uh, it's a very um, uh, uncom uncommon thing among, among uh, other instruments musical instruments, for example, a piano. Uh, you can't really do that because of the black and white uh, keys. So it's a very unique uh, uh, feature that you can uh, find only on uh, fretted instruments. So to uh, use this uh, concept um, to, to best, we, we came up with a new representation, which is a relative string fret. So in your vector now, you will have uh, uh, part of your vector that represents the root fret. So it's basically the, uh, the position of your index finger. And uh, the second part of the vector will be exactly the same as uh, the string frets, but only for uh, five uh, frets. So you will have uh, six parts with uh, five components. So six for each uh, strings. And this will be uh, like a portion of your guitar uh, that can be moved by uh, moving the, the root fret components. So for example, if you have an A minor, mm -hmm. it like this, and you want to play uh, a C minor after that, mm -hmm. it will be exactly the same uh, vector uh, for uh, the relative position, but you will just have the root fret part that will change. Uh, so this is very interesting for, um, um, <clears throat> this is very interesting for uh, for analysis because you can exclude the root frets uh, from your uh, the root fret part of your vector, and you can uh, so uh, analyze uh, uh, only the position of uh, your hand on your guitar. Um, we had also another issue, which was uh, the open strings that we had to to in, uh, integrate on our encodings. 
because I didn't play some your fretboard, you can play an open string. So for example, if you play the intro of Still Loving You by Scott Holmes, you play it as a chord. If you want to represent this, you will have an open string and um, a new finger is uh, at uh, the sixth uh, fret. So to represent this, we added uh, one digit in front of every uh, string, part, string part of the vector to represent uh, to represent this um, this open string. So uh, to sum up, we have uh, three uh, representation: pitch, so piano roll, which are every note that you can play on a guitar. String fret, string fret, which represents uh, every position that you can uh, find on your guitar, and relative string frets, which are uh, a portion of your fretboard uh, according to uh, root fret. Uh, so relative string fret encodes almost the same uh, the same information, but with smaller vectors. Uh, so it, uh, it's quite interesting, for example, for machine learning systems or something like this. And uh, we also made the three uh, more um, representation for uh, sustained notes because if you represent uh, one vector every sustained notes, you can't really differentiate uh, repeated notes from sustained notes. Uh, so yeah, we made uh, also uh, three other representation, which are the same but with uh, an added part and new vector to uh, to have the information of uh, sustained notes. Um, so um, Mathieu told you that uh, we, we worked with uh, our best music. So um, uh, our best music is, uh, is the company that edited the, the software Guitar Pro, which is a tablature edition software. And uh, with this software, they also uh, provide uh, a data corpus of uh, tablatures, which is called My Songbook. Uh, this corpus of data is um, uh, to more than 2,400 uh, tablatures, which are uh, transcribed by uh, professional musicians, so they are very accurate. And um, and so if, with uh, those data, we made a parser the, to um, get from uh, guitar profiles to Music 21 uh, structures, and it will be soon. Um, and this parser will be soon available on our website. So now Mathieu will talk to you about the statistics that we made on uh, this corpus uh, using our different representation. Thank you, Jules. So the first stats we can see is just to see what frets are used. And I mean, many statistics I will show you today are not very surprising, but uh, it's good to see them to confirm this, uh, these facts, uh, seeing the actual data on the MySongbu corpus. So uh, the majority of notes are played on lower frets or even on open strings and are mostly unaltered pitches. That you find mostly the minor pentatonic scales on the, of E and A, uh, E minor, A minor, that are used in many pop rock songs, but also that from the basis of, I mean, other, uh, other students as well. But anyway, the goal with our recording was not only to study the, I mean, the, the individual notes that were played. Uh, remember that our motivation was to have an encoding that can be close to uh, what guitar music do signify, do, do, do mean, I mean, uh, and we can have a look on that by comparing the diversity of vectors we have with the different encodings that you presented. Uh, actually, we have more than 2 billion 16 nodes. And uh, if you look, for example, for unique vectors, you see that, of course, there are more unique vectors when you add the string information compared to just a pitch the piano roll, uh, because you can play the same notes on several strings. Uh, but what is very interesting is that this number goes down here uh, when you go to the um, when you go to the the number of unique relative position uh, at the end you have just more than 200 268 unique relative position uh, and that has far less for the absolute unique position another thing to see this c10 colon here the c10 colon is the ratio uh, of um, the 10 most frequent position and so if you take the most frequent, the 10 most frequent relative position, they account for more than 30% of the relative position in all the corpus. 
So let's focus on uh, some other stats we made in this, this study. Uh, first, we focus on single notes uh, because the guitar can play both, can have, I mean, a rhythmic role, plays chords and so on, but it can also have a lead role. And most often, the real lead role is the guitar is playing, I mean, melodies and so on. So here, it's a plot that is limited to uh, the moments where the guitar plays just one note and plays one note where play two notes on the same string. And what is, I mean, completely expected is that uh, the majority of cases is that you say on the same fret, zero here, that just mean that uh, you are just repeating the note or holding the note. Uh, but you find also that most movements, most shifts, let's say, but shifts on the same string are plus two and minus two frets. So that means that you just move by one second, one major second uh, up or down. So that is expected. But something more interesting, if you look on successive single notes on adjacent strings, because you know that, I mean, the guitar uh, between, if you take the lowest strings between the E and the A, you have a fourth. Between the A and the D also between the D and the G. But when you go to the, the G, B pair, you just have a third, a major third here. Mm. And at the end, you have, again, a perfect fourth. Mm. And I mean, uh, that's why we call the guitar quasi-isomorphic. It's not completely isomorphic, because on one side, you have the open strings. When, when you have something that the user open string, you can just you cannot just translate the, the, your end. And on the other side, you have this GB pair, meaning that some patterns you do with your fingers on the lowest strings, you can transpose them just one string higher. But as soon as you reach the GB pair, you cannot do that. And you see that here, this is what the, the points that are rounded, that are circulated here, uh, show that you have a different behavior uh, between on this adjacent pair and of course, it's expected because uh, even when you are playing on this pair, you favor to play, let's say, perfect fourths and perfect fifths rather than uh, augmented or diminished uh, intervals. OK. Uh, so now let's focus no, not in any way on uh, single notes, but on chords. Uh, so at the top, you have the most frequent absolute chords, absolute position somewhere uh, on the fretboard. And at the bottom, you have the most frequent relative position. That means that you just forget the end position. Uh, OK. So let's just uh, begin, perhaps, by the, with the, the green part. So if you take the green part, you see that here you have the E major, that is a very well-known E major chord that you can just take at uh, the bottom uh, of the neck. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Jules. Uh, and you can uh, so this uh, this chord accounts for more than two, two percent of the chords, the chords with at least uh, four notes. Uh, but you have also the, this position is used, for example, for the F major chord. Yes. That is just, uh, I think that your mic is, uh, you are muted, uh, Jill, but we, we, we anyway, we, we see what you are playing. <laughs> um, and you see that it's also about 2% uh, of the course. But what is more interesting, if you count relatively, if you say what we put here in brackets, you have 7.5% uh, uh, of all relative position that share this position. It can be E, it can be F, but it can be also chords. Uh, higher on the neck. Uh, so, and, and you find also other chords like here D, A minor, C, and so on that are put in uh, other position. But there is something that is very surprising is that the most used guitar position in the Maisonbu corpus in this 2005 is this yellow position here. And you see it's an A major, but it's an incomplete A major. So we can just press play it at the, the bottom of the neck with open string. And so here, this position, why is it incomplete? It's just because you do not play the highest uh, string. So there are several explanations. But one explanation could be that if you go higher on the neck, for example, if you play a C major, but with this position, you have two different ways to do it. First, you can put three fingers, but uh, like Julie is showing right now, 
But if you are putting three fingers, I mean, this position is it's not so easy, and you can make uh, ring all the the, the 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 strings. And another option is just to put two fingers, and you have also the ring fingers that is playing a, a sort of barre uh, chord. And in that position, the highest string is not cor correctly fretted. I mean, it's not in the chord, and so you can uh, you can just avoid them. And actually. Uh, many, many uh, transcriptions of tablatures do not include this highest string on this position. That was surprising, but we really checked on the transcription. And as you said, the transcription of my songbook is very, very accurate. Uh, and uh, that just we discussed with guitar players, and just as position is really, really used, uh, not playing to uh, an every uh, alto the highest string. Okay. Uh, perhaps the last uh, plot, the last plot that we split chord usage among genres. Uh, so uh, at the top row is chords with two or three notes, and the bottom row is chords with at least four notes. And for example, if you, well, the, the classification is very, very broad. For example, in classical, uh, there are both, I mean, Baroque, classical, and romantic pieces. And you see that blues and jazz are together. And I mean, even rock is a very broad uh, category. And anyway, we see interesting uh, trends. Uh, if you see, but both in uh, chords with less notes or with more notes, that both metal and rock have uh, many uh, these green chords. What are these green chords? It's chords without thirds. That it's like the power chords with that you have just as a tonic and a fifth. Perhaps you can just play that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and um, with the, that chord, uh, I mean, yes, it sounds perhaps a bit poor if you play on the classical on the folk guitar. But if you on the classical guitar at least, but if you have uh, if you play an electric guitar with some distortion, you have a lot of added harmonics. And in fact, the added harmonics uh, makes that you do not need to play really very subtle chords with your fingers. So that's one of the explanation that uh, we know that there are more in fifths and fourths in metal and also in rock. On the other side, I mean, if you look on the, the blues jazz, of course, we have many sevens uh, with many variations. And on the classical, baroque, and romantic repertoire, you have also all these gray chords here. Uh, there are chords with just two notes. Um, uh, perhaps let's hear know what uh, the. So that was a lute uh, intabulation uh, of the Josquin des Pré chanson. Uh, and you see that here you have some just thirds without full chords. And uh, in classical repertoire, you have many of these kind of things. And you see that the difference between the other repertoire is very striking, that uh, you have more, uh, I mean, just uh, these this intervals. OK, so uh, that was chord usage. Uh, that's all. So just to sum up, uh, we try to encode tablature uh, to have meaningful vectors to help us to analyze music, but perhaps also for further study to uh, to do music with, I mean, uh, uh, AI task on analysis and generation. We have a parser for guitar profiles, and we have some corpus analysis. And we release some data. Uh, the problem is that we cannot release the raw corpus because, the, as you probably know, I mean, most of the My Songbook corpus is uh, actually pop rock songs uh, with uh, legal constraints. And um, so we cannot release the corpus. But anyway, what we release is the 1,000 most frequent vectors. So you can go to the website and download not the, the chords. And this will make you, you can build approximately about all the, the figures we do uh, in the paper. And I hope also that you could uh, also have uh, other things because what we did here was really a first analysis and I'm sure that there can have some things in this data. Okay, so uh, thank you again for your attention. And yes. Thank you very much indeed, Mathieu and Jules for the presentation and for your work. And, and thank you, Jules, for the live demonstrations and, uh, and the live music, which is always uh, something to thank for in, in this context. OK, so now the, the floor is open to questions and comments, uh, Jules and Mathieu. So um, anyone, please just make me a sign or just uh, type 
a question in, in the chat. Uh, I might have a question. Um, um, you mentioned in, in the paper and you showed an example that, um, because it's a, a, I find fascinating the study of hand position. I think it's, it's, it's a great contribution and it's something very, very interesting to look at, to analyze uh, music and, and music performance, right? And, and, and I see a lot of publications of that. Uh, but um, uh, you show many, many, many chords that are played arpeggiated, right? So no, no, that is a chord, but and, and, and getting the tablature will appear as single notes, right? So uh, do you do any, any Pre-processing step or anything to find those chords and, and add it to your statistics uh, somehow. Mm. What do you think? Well, because this was I mean, the lettering was encoded in the guitar profiles. Uh, yeah, uh, usually the the chords they are played like uh, like this, but uh, like uh, one uh, not after another, but uh, they are written. Uh, um, most of the times they are written as uh, like they are played in uh, one chord, but uh, with a uh, arpeggio, we we didn't really uh, summarize uh, them uh, as, uh, as chords. Yeah, because there are some annotation with lettering saying that you should lettering the chords, and we can analyze that. But you are right. I mean, there can be bias with that, and you know there can be also huge bias. Um, if uh, you don't know which chords you are taking, because with this notion of repeated chords, uh, repeated notes, and so so uh, basically we have two options in our stats. Uh, either we take every 60 notes, and if we take even 66 notes, there will be some chords that will be highly repeated, or we take just chords that are repeated, but even uh, some chords can uh, can just enter, can be just un unbalanced, and so so we're right. It's, it's difficult just to 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 see the good granularity to see what we should study. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for the answer. So, anyone has any other question or comment to our presenters uh, now? Uh, let me check. Uh, okay, so um, in, in about the applications of, of your transcriptions, uh, uh, I've seen in the paper you mentioned some generative tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have something more specific about this? How, how to apply this? This uh, your research? Yeah. We, we we would like. I mean, we try to do that. Uh, it's uh, especially Louis Digo who is the co-author of uh, the paper, uh, but who is not here today. Uh, he is now working. I mean, on a generation of uh, of guitar tablatures. There have been already quite some papers in, in that field, but we definitely think that, uh, I mean, it's better to, to generate tablatures instead of actual scores. It's better to generate, if you generate a tablature, that means that you take into account uh, something that is playable, that you can play, uh, and uh, that is uh, really, you know, that is, let's say, under the fingers of a guitar player. And you can could say the same thing for uh, uh, when you are general when we generate some piano music and so on. Uh, and this notion of uh, so as usually explained with a relative encoding, you, you we just allow to I mean to put your fingers on four or five frets depending on where your uh, end position depending on what you, your end position. But um, actually, it's it's even lower than that. I mean. People are really used to use two or three frets uh, when their hand, uh, once their hand is uh, at some position. So of course, some machine learning model could, could learn that by itself. You, we know that uh, all that the machine learning models could learn everything. But if you, we, we believe that if you present the machine learning model either for analysis or for generation uh, data uh, in a structured way that is coherent with the music, it will be easier for uh, this kind of tasks. I see. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, I look forward to see how, how, how this uh, developed in, in the future. We, ha we have a, a question from from Conkling, from Dar Conkling. Um, for analysis, did you stratify your corpus according to different tunings, or is it all standard tuning? Hey, hey Daniel, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, um, here it's all standard tunings because we do not, so we excluded, I don't know if we are 10 or 20% of the corpus that were not in the standard tuning. 
because uh, the data and the other tunings were not enough to have uh, meaningful data. So here we were just, uh, but you are right, uh, Darrell. I mean, if you study uh, other tuning, but basically you will have other hand moves. And uh, when we talk to, to guitar players, uh, when they say, okay, uh, I play, I mean, let's say folk music, but uh, my bass chord is not E, but it's D, it's D A D. Uh, they know that they have, I won't say it's another instrument, but somehow they have different gestures uh, and that are, uh, that could be more convenient for some styles of, uh, for some music styles. So uh, you are right, it's, uh, it could be more wide by the studying other things. We could also study just bass music on the bass. Um. Okay, we have a time for one more question. So Claire Arthur, I think you, you have a question. So please, uh, yes. Yeah, I was just thinking about that last point too, because I wonder if it would be too messy, but if you could somehow, since you already have the relative fret, if you could uh, add another relative, uh, like for each, uh, like that's unique to a string. So let's say you have a drop D tuning, um, that would be like another relative, like ah. a minus one, but then it now it fits, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that may be an idea. Yeah, yeah, you, you mean to encode relatively either there's a turning, oh, why not? Why not? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Claire. <laughs> but um, I was wondering, because uh, you mentioned um, towards the beginning that you were a little bit surprised for the, the propensity of the A chord. Um, uh, but then towards the end, you showed all those graphs and I did, it, you didn't um, seem surprised. So I thought maybe I'm like misinterpreting. I wondered if it's, if it's not too much trouble, if you could share your screen again to, to show the, the, the slide you had with all of the graphs. Um, and because you were talking about um, how they're all different and of course um, by the genre, but I, if I was understanding the graphs properly, which is possible I'm not, it seemed that um, in the like rock corpus, you have this huge proportion, like most of the chords are, uh, are power chords. Am I reading that right? I mean, it's power chords for chords with two or three notes. So it's just, you have two, it's mean that when you use just two or three notes, but if you look at the bottom row, uh, most of the chords are, are major actually. So is this the the percentage of the top? Is that a, as a percentage of the whole corpus then? So like there's as many power chords as there are major chords? Yes, uh, no, it's just at the top, the top plot here. Uh, I don't know if you see my mouse pointer, but yes. the, top, the, the top row is chords with just two or three notes. So of course you have, you are more uh, chance to have uh, power chords or to have chords with a third. But the bottom row here is a chord with four notes of more. So if you take this chord, actually in, in rock music, you have even more ma major chords than in uh, the classical style. But sure, I see. OK, so the, it's the 20% separate like of each of those yeah. sort of subsets. Yeah, 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 I yeah. see. That yeah, makes and, more sense. Okay. And, and the bar are broken just because they were really huge. But it means that you, when you have two or three notes in rock, you see that it's uh, about half of the chords when you have two or three notes are just fifths. Yeah. Uh, and in classical music, it's just, uh, I mean, first and sixth. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, okay. A great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So I think we're now on time. Uh, so uh, let's thank uh, uh, Jules and Mathieu and all the presenters for this uh, very interesting session. Uh, indeed. So with this, uh, we close uh, this second session of, for today. I think we have a break now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, right? Yes. And um, yeah, go yeah. ahead, please. No, 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 Claire, please, 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 please. Uh, Yeah, no, just a 45 minute break. Uh, and the next session will start at uh, 1630 UTC. And I just wanted to remind everyone, as we forgot uh, after the first session, that um, the, there is a separate uh, link for each of the sessions. So I think a few people were coming back to the same uh, link. So just as a reminder to check. Uh, each of those. Thank you again. And thank you, Rafael, for sharing. Thank you. See you later.